good morning. It's great to be back here. And uh, Elliot, thank you for uh, the introduction. Malaysia, indeed. Um, yes, and we need lots of uh, gospel workers in Malaysia. Wink, wink. Yeah, now I'm putting pressure on you. Anyway, friends, uh, it's great to see you this morning. Great to be back again to uh, Litcom uh, AM. And uh, lots of things have changed, isn't it? But praise God and thank God that um, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And um, friends, today I will be preaching from Acts chapter 11. Um, and it'll be great if you have your Bibles open uh, in front of you. Great. And also welcome to uh, those of you who are watching uh, the service online. How about we open in a word of prayer? Dear God, help us this morning to be receptive to your word and take in your message so that we may please you as your chosen people. Holy Spirit, stir our hearts and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, a few days ago, uh, I had lots of time, you know, Bible college students. So I just typed in um, in Google, who qualifies to receive? Just who qualifies to receive? Just to see what are the suggestions that will come up. And true enough, my prediction was right. The first line said, who qualifies to receive the, what do you guess? No idea? The covid Vaccine, of course. That's the first thing. That's the first thing that came out. And guess what? The second line was similar as well. Who can take the COVID vaccine? In fact, the first few suggestions were about the COVID vaccine. It seems people have been uh, kind of concerned and typing in and asking who qualifies to receive this vaccine. I'm sure some of us would have done the same as well because we care for our loved ones. We care for our own health as well, right? As such, we want to know on what basis does someone receive the COVID-19 vaccine. In many countries, the priority is first given to those who are on, a, on the higher risk category groups, such as healthcare workers, aged care workers, and then to elders, adults, followed by adults with health conditions. And the list continues until it covers every single group. So you receive help based on the risk category. The higher the risk, the faster you get help. The lower the risk, the longer you have to wait. Now, friends, if we are concerned of this virus and uh, we want to find out the conditions to receive help, what if I tell you that there is a much far greater threat to humanity than this virus? As of now, guess what? The fatality rate of the COVID-19 virus is 3%. Three out of 100 people will die. But the fatality rate of this quote unquote virus I am talking about is 100%. 100 out of 100 people will surely die. Now, what is this virus I'm talking about? Now, oh, you would have guessed. Sin, sin, of course. Now, friends, I'm using this term virus very loosely here, but sin is just like the COVID-19 virus, if you think about it. It is an intruder to our world. It threatens our life and we need treatment. We need to be saved from this threat. However, unlike COVID, sin is like a virus that we will never be able to find a cure or create a vaccine on our own. That, my friends, is not good news. As such, only God, our creator, can save us from this unseen terminal illness. So if we are concerned and trying to find out the criterion in treating or saving someone from COVID-19, how much more should we be concerned and ask what criterion are needed to be saved from this far more deadly thing? On what basis does God save people? Does he have a list of high risk and low risk people? Does he make it available to a specific social group and discriminate the others? It's an important question to ask because no one, my friends, no one is spared from this virus, from this sickness, sin. You can stay away from coronavirus, but you cannot hide from this deadly, ancient virus called sin. As such, it is right, it is right for us to ask on what basis 
does God save people? Well, friends, today's passage will answer that exact question. On what basis does God save people? Now, if you take a look at your sermon outlines, you can see the roadmap for today's sermon. I will firstly retell the Acts 11 story. Then we will look at two lessons that we can learn. And finally, we will look into two applications for us. But before that, it is good to remind ourselves of the context of today's narrative because it has been about two weeks since we last heard um, Pastor Kamal's sermon, right? So in case you can't recall, let me briefly, very briefly, tell you where we are right now. In Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter was in Joppa. He was visiting there. And at Joppa, he had this vision, a vision where a large sheet came down from heaven, which had all sorts of animals on it. And there was a voice that said to Peter, Peter, get up, kill and eat. But Peter was very careful because being a Jew meant he should not eat unclean meat, unclean animals. But the voice said, what God has made clean, you should not call unclean. Anyway, after that vision, Peter was immediately commanded by God to go and preach to a centurion, a captain, a captain called Cornelius in Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was not a Jew, friends, but he feared God. He feared God. So when Peter arrived at his house, he realized that God wanted Peter to share the good news of Jesus to this Gentile, to his family, someone that Jews like Peter would call unclean. But Peter obeyed God and preached the gospel to Cornelius and his family. And guess what? Not only did they accept Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit. Peter learned that God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation who believes in him. Now, that's the context. Great. Now, friends, uh, we'll look into the story uh, today in Acts chapter 11. And for simplicity's sake, I've broken the story into five mini scenes, five small scenes. Hopefully that helps. Let's look into the story. The story begins in scene one, the Jews condemn association with the Gentiles. That's scene one. Now we are told in verses one to three, friends, that Peter returned to Jerusalem after his incident with, uh, in Caesarea. And the Jews were not happy because Peter has entered into the house of a Gentile. He has associated himself with a non-Jew, with unclean people. They question him why he had to go to these people. So in their mind, the good news of Jesus is ethnocentric or only for the Jews. Even though they have accepted Jesus, the Jews thought that Christianity was a sect or a subset of Judaism. So if Gentiles want to believe in Jesus, they must first become like us, the Jews. That's their idea. They have still not understood they becoming a disciple of Jesus is a whole different thing. So friends, at this stage, most of the believers were from the Jewish background. They were Jewish Christians. But can you see the irony? Because Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, isn't it? You shall be my witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But here they are unable to accept the possibility of Gentiles entering into the kingdom of God. They are trying to fit the gospel into the mold of their Jewish religion. But it's impossible, friends. This is exactly what Jesus spoke against in Mark chapter 2. For some of you can... If you can remember your Bible, that the gospel, Jesus says, the gospel is like this new wine which requires new wineskin. This is the message. You cannot fit this new wine into your old wineskin. It doesn't work that way. What they are experiencing, friends, is the dawn of a new age. Christianity is not a sect or a subset of Jewish religion. It is a whole new faith. That's seed one. Scene two. Peter preaches to the Gentiles. Now, friends, in this scene, Peter explains, Peter explains and defends his evangelistic meeting with Cornelius and his family. So he began with the vision that we just read just now. In fact, uh, if you can remember Pastor Kamal's sermon, we learned that for the Jews, eating unclean food, the outside cleanliness determines the inner cleanliness, isn't it? So you become like what you eat. If you eat unclean food, you become unclean. But the lesson Peter is trying to share with his Jewish Christian friends is that no one or nothing is unclean in God's eyes. 
He learned through the vision that God accepts everyone who comes to him despite their racial or cultural background. The gospel, my friends, is for everyone. It is for everyone. But don't forget that Peter is in a very difficult situation here. He's not just propagating something new to the Jews, but he's speaking against their traditions, against their teachings, which has been handed down from Moses about a thousand years ago. Now, you know what this reminds me of for those of you Marvel fans out there. Oh, now I'm saying, ooh, all right. Yeah, <laughs> Marvel fans, if you remember the story of Black Panther, where Chala, the king of Wakanda, stands alone against in front of all his fathers, the forefathers, every single one of them. And he says these words. He says this, you were wrong. All of you were wrong to turn your back on the rest of the world. Now that, my friend, that is the perfect illustration to understand this scene in Acts chapter 11. Peter is against his whole tradition, his worldview, his upbringing. It is Peter against his own kind. And he's trying to convince them and prove to them that the gospel is indeed for everyone, not just for the Jews. That is why if you look at verse 4, it says that Peter began explaining precisely as it happened. So Peter explained in detail not only the vision he had, but also God's command to him. Have a look at what he says in verse 12. And the Spirit told me to go with them making no distinction. So he's outlining everything before them to help them see that Peter was all the while obeying God's word. And that's not all. He tells them in verse 15 that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family just as it had fallen on them, the Jews. So Gentiles, my friends, are now added into God's family. Who is Peter to stand in the way? Now that's scene two. Scene three. God shows no favoritism. And we come to this scene. This is the climax. This is the climax of the story. Will the Jews now accept Peter's defense and his detailed sharing? Well, thankfully, the Jewish believers finally understood that God is not a Jewish God, but the God of the world. Look at what it says in verse 18. It says, when they heard these things, they fell silent. They fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So finally, they have come to accept that God's agenda and theirs are not the same. And they need to be on the same page with God. You know, just now we were singing that song, right? Um, God is with us. He's on our side. Well, <laughs> over here it says that God is on his side. We are the ones who need to get on his side. But I don't want to downplay this scene, my friends, because what we have just read here is a significant passage. It is a very significant passage for the Jews to say, wow, we are not the only ones who are saved. God is for everyone. It is a big matter. It is huge. Now, why is that so? Well, friends, it is because the Jews believed for many years that they were the special chosen race, that the God of the universe is a Jewish God, but they have misunderstood everything. In their mind, God chose them out of the many nations in the world because they are special. They have failed to understand that God chose them so that they can now bring God's message to the other nations. God choosing and inviting the Jews to have a special relationship with them have been misunderstood. They felt they were privileged, higher, better, superior, but the reason why they were chosen and invited by God is so that they can now forward this message. They can forward, forward this invitation to all the other nations. Instead, the Jews looked down on others while they themselves were recipients of God's grace. But my friends, God's word and plan cannot be stopped. Jesus' death and resurrection has now advanced God's plan to invite everyone into his family, whether the Jews accept it or not. Thus, for the Jews to finally accept that God has granted the same privilege to the Gentiles, that's not a small thing. That's scene three. Scene four, Barnabas and Saul preach to the Gentiles. Now friends, in this scene, what we are told is that God's word spread even further. 
after the church meeting in Jerusalem, we are told that the believers have started preaching the gospel, even to the Gentiles, even to the Gentiles. Look at verse 21, what it says there. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Friends, Gentiles are entering God's kingdom. They are entering God's family too. Isn't that beautiful? And wait, there's more. There's more to this. Verse 22, it says, News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Wow. At the start of today's chapter, the Jewish believers were furious because Peter preached to the Gentiles. But now, here they are, the same Jewish believers sending a godly teacher called Barnabas to disciple these Gentiles. Now, friends, that's amazing. Not to forget, remember our good old friend Saul? A few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Eugene preached about Saul, the persecutor turned believer. Well, guess what? He's back in town. Because Barnabas invites him over to do ministry, and they go to Antioch as missionaries. What a reversal. Outsiders becoming insiders. I hope you are following me, friends, because this is such an encouraging story of how God reverses the plans of evil, and advances his unstoppable mission. And one last interesting note, look at the last part of verse 26. It says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. <laughs> the first ones to be called Christians are the Gentile believers of Antioch, not the Jews, the Gentiles. They are now called by this unique title which for the next 2,000 years will be used by every believer under heaven. Friends, this is a reset of the status quo. No one can claim, I have more share in Jesus' ministry because I'm of this particular race. No, God shows no partiality. And now we come to our final scene, scene number five. The Gentiles send aid to the Jews. Friends, at the start of the story, the Jews condemned associating with the Gentiles. But by the end of our story, the Gentile believers are now helping their Jewish brothers by sending help. They're sending help through Barnabas and Saul. But that's a beautiful picture of gospel kinship, isn't it? Now, you might be wondering, why do they need help, Tony? What's going on? Well, we are told in verse 28 that a famine was coming. A famine was coming. So the Gentile believers decided to help their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. What a picture of interdependence, friend. Do you see that? Just as how the Gentiles benefited spiritually through the Jews, now the Jews are benefiting physically and financially from the Gentiles. They are now indeed one family, and racial segregation is slowly passing on, and a more multi-racial body is being formed. However, spoiler alert, the problem is not fully solved. In Acts 15, the Jews strike back. I mean, but that's, that's an episode for another day, right? But for today, I want us to reflect on Acts 11. And I'm not sure if you noticed, friend, did you see how today's passage has a unique breakdown? If you're still unclear, have a look at the title of each scene quickly. Have a look at them. Did you notice that scene one is about Jews and Gentiles? Scene five is about Jews and Gentiles. Scene two is about Peter preaching to the Gentiles. Scene four is about Barnabas and Saul preaching to the Gentiles. And in the center, we are left with scene three. Now, for those of you Bible nerds out there, this technical term is chiasm. But you know what? I don't like that term. I like the layman term called the burger. You know burger, yeah? Now, think of a burger. You have your bun, your lettuce, your patty, your lettuce, your bun, right? Now, the best part is at the center. The patty, of course. Yes, so that's exactly what we see here. Scene one and five are pears. Scene two and four are pears. And scene three, the most delicious part, which contains the message of the passage. And the message is, God shows no favoritism. Friends, God shows no favoritism in saving people. So those are the five mini scenes for you. All right, friends, let's look at two lessons we can learn from this passage today. Number one, God saves people out of his grace and shows no partiality. God saves people out of his grace and shows no partiality. 
In today's story, we learn that God does not save people because of their status, because of their culture, race, background, educational level, or anything like that. It is purely by His grace. You know, friends, something amusing about the Old Testament is that it has always been talking about Israel becoming a blessing and saving other nations. It is outward focused, not inward focused. Whether it is God's promise to Abraham or Isaiah's prophecy, the message has always been clear that God will save other nations by his grace, just as he saved Israel. And yet, and yet the Jews have somehow conveniently overlooked this message in the gospel, in the Old Testament. So that's lesson number one. God saves people out of his grace and shows no partiality. Lesson number two. God saves people who trust in Jesus and gives the same status to every believer. God saves people who trust in Jesus and gives the same status to every believer. In Peter's defense that we just read, Peter said something significant in verse 16. Have a look at that. This is what he said. I remembered what the Lord said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, these words were spoken directly to Jesus' disciples in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. But the very reality that the Gentiles too now have received the gift of the Holy Spirit shows that the Gentiles are given the same status as their Jewish friends. So God doesn't save people based on their status, but once he saves them, he gives them a new status to be his children. Forgiven sealed with the Holy Spirit, adopted into his family. Now, every Christian has something to offer to the body of Christ, not, this, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. So that's lesson number two. God saves people who trust in Jesus and gives the same status to every believer. Friends, before we move on to the application section, I would like to quickly, quickly address those of you who are seated here or watching online who are yet to accept Jesus into your life. Now, friends, if that is you, allow me to encourage you, encourage you to ponder upon the message today. God's grace and mercy is available. It's available to anyone who would turn to him. He does not show favoritism in saving people, nor do you have to try hard to save yourself. What is required from our part is faith. So if you think you're not good enough to be a Christian, know that God does not show partiality and his grace is sufficient for you. And if you think you are too good, you are good enough, and that's why you don't want to be a Christian, know that you too are infected by this virus called sin and there is no escape from it. So what is stopping you? So friends, in light of the lessons we learned, how can we live better for Jesus this week? How can we apply the passage today as Christians living in Sydney? We will look at two types of applications. The first one I shall call the necessary application, which applies to everyone here in this room and watching online. No one is exempted for that, from that. The second one is the possible application. It applies to some of us, doesn't apply to some of us. So that's more like applications by category. Okay, the first application under the necessary application is to pray. What are we specifically praying for? We need to pray that God will grant us a heart that accepts everyone without being prejudiced, ethnocentric, or tribalistic. We need to pray again, let me repeat again, we need to pray that God will grant us a heart that accepts everyone without being prejudiced, ethnocentric, or tribalistic. Now, why do we need to do that? Why do we need to pray that? Because deep within us, my dear friends, sin has distorted our idea of humanity. We were created to be social beings living in a loving relationship with God, and with one another. But because of sin, we don't live in harmony with him and with one another. Instead, we are inclined to stick with our own kind. 
each race thinking they are better than the other, each social group thinking they are greater than the other. And sadly, my dear friends, Christians are not spared from this. I know of Christians who say they love Jesus and yet, and yet when a new person walks into their church unexpectedly that Sunday morning and sits beside them, they end up holding tight to their handbags, not even wanting to greet that newcomer. I know of Christians who say they love Christians from other race, they are fine with that. But the moment their children starts dating a Christian from another race, they can't accept it. I've also visited churches who specifically cater for young people from upper middle class families. Now, of course, they don't state it in their mission statement or anything like that. But you can see it. You can see it through their church setting, their clothing, their fashion, and even their activities, which do not suit the regular Christian. Friends, this may not be you, but sadly, I personally know of many people whose theology and lifestyle don't match. They know tribalism is wrong, but continue to live in it. And sadly, many non-Christians have said that they don't want to attend church because Christians don't practice what they preach. Some have sadly received that, that look. You know that look? That look that says, I am not comfortable with you attending or visiting my church. So there is a deep tendency in us because of sin to be tribalistic, sticking with our own kind in a church setting. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, the reason why the first application here is prayer is because we sinful human beings are blinded by our own mistakes. We can be quick in pointing other people's fault, but we overlook our own faults. We all have blind spots. And I suspect for our context here in Sydney, in a multiracial Sydney, we think we are very tolerant and receptive to one another because we live, we work, we play with people from different backgrounds. But we may not be able to see our own tribalism. Do not be deceived, friends, because today's story is a good lesson for you and me. You know why? Can you remember with whom Peter was living in Joppa? A guy called Simon. And what was Simon's occupation? <laughs> you can find the answer in Acts 9.43. You don't have to go there. Simon was a tanner. A tanner. It means he worked with leather. He worked with leather, coming in contact with dead animals all the time. His occupation was unclean. And yet Peter was living in his house as his host. Peter was fine with that. Peter was fine with that. But the moment God called Peter to accept, to preach, and to love the Gentile, Peter said no. Peter said they are common. They are unclean. Can you believe it? He was friends with Simon the Tanner and even enjoying the hospitality of this guy under his roof. But Peter could not go the next step to love and accept the Gentile as his brother. Friends, I pray that this will not be us. Many of us have non-Christian friends from different cultures, different social statuses, but the moment we are called to love them deeply, we struggle. So that is why prayer is crucial because we can't change our hearts. We cannot do that. Only God can. So pray that you will not show partiality or call anyone unclean or view anyone lesser than you. It is against the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is not tribalistic. It is evangelistic. It is missional. Christians do not self-preserve. They self-sacrifice. Our churches should not exist for ourselves, but for others. So pray. Now, the second application under the necessary application is to be thankful. Now, you might be thinking, come on, Tony, praying, thankful, wow, elementary stuff. But... Now, this is necessary, friends, thankful. Because God has given us, just as verse 18 says, repentance unto life, repentance that leads to life. We, my dear friends, the non-Jewish people, we, the Gentiles, are shown mercy. Mercy that gives us eternal life. And no one, no one can snatch that away from you 
or me. Not even the devil. Do you really understand what this verse means? Do you really understand this, friends? God in his kindness has saved you and me. People who are undeserving, helpless, self-centered sinners. Sinners who deserve judgment and yet shown mercy and given eternal life. And God has even blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Does that mean anything to you? Friends, many of us, many of us go through life just to survive one more day. We start the day by not looking forward to the day, dragging ourselves out of the bed to go to school or to work, go through the motions or drudgeries of work, and then drag ourselves back home just to find out, oh, there are more responsibilities at home. And finally drop on our beds with a big sigh, knowing that the same routine awaits us the next day as well. In fact, I identify with that, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I resonate with you. And sadly, work is not the only thing that drains our gratitude to God. When sickness, struggles, stress comes into our lives, it is very easy to sigh then to give thanks. When our plans don't go the way we want it to go, or when life becomes unfair, it is easier to be bitter than to be thankful. When our dating life becomes messy, or marriage becomes disappointing, or parenting becomes burdening, it is easier to give up than to give thanks. Friends, it is difficult to be thankful in these challenging situations unless, unless you know what God has done for you. He has done something that no one can or will do for you, my dear friends. Not your friends, not your parents, not your spouse, not even yourself can do this for you. God has forgiven you and granted you a new identity as his own child. His own child. Clothing you with the Holy Spirit, promising you that he will never leave you, never forsake you. Something good about that song. He will never leave us, not forsake us. That's right. And when life here on earth ends, nothing can snatch you away from the love of God. We, the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, have also been given life, repentance that leads to life. Shouldn't that give us enough reasons to wake up in the morning and say, God, no matter what happens today, I want to thank you because you have saved me from eternal condemnation and given me eternal life. Friends, until you and I truly come to comprehend the weight of Jesus' death on the cross, on your behalf, on my behalf, we are going to be frustrated all our life and say that life is meaningless. But I pray, I pray that you and I will never forget this gift of salvation from God. And that in itself will give us 10,000 reasons to go through our suffering with thanksgiving. So be thankful at all times and in all circumstances because you are safe in his arms. Now, friends, for the possible application, I'm going to present it to you by categories. The first category of people I would like to address are the Litcom AM church members. Litcom AM church members. It's, it's an application specifically for you who consider themselves, who considers your, consider yourselves church members of this congregation. So if you are visiting, watching online, you're not a church member, it doesn't apply to you. Litcom AM. What are you doing to ensure that your congregation is actively inviting and welcoming newcomers to help them understand and experience God's love? Ask yourselves, do you have a tendency to stick together with the familiar people? Or do you reach out to newcomers, especially those who are clearly not of your church demography? Brothers and sisters in Christ, I have heard Christians say that they choose their church based on the racial demography of the church so that they feel comfortable. And I'm not talking about language barriers, okay? I'm talking about people who purely want to attend a church where their culture or race is the majority. Can you believe that? Even Christians can be tribalistic. We may not say it out loud to people, but we can become too comfortable with our own church demography. 
with our own kind. Perhaps for some of us, it can be that we are only comfortable with a particular socio-economic people, group attending our church, or a particular cultural background. Now, Litcom AM, I want you to do this. Look around you. Look around you. Look around the people. Yes, that's right. Okay, now look back. Yes, thank you. <laughs> now, this is my question to you. Ask yourself this. Will I still be worshipping God in Litcom if half of the people here leave and God brings people from different parts of the world, from different walks of life, who worship God in their own style and in their own flavor? Ask yourself this question. For some of us, the moment there is imbalance in our church demography, we start feeling uncomfortable to attend church. Once an elderly man told me that he decided to pull his family out of the church that they have been attending for many years because foreigners started attending their church. Can you believe that? So Litcom AM, are you committed to worshipping God no matter what your church's racial, financial, or social demographic is? Or are you trying to preserve your church's demography so that it will always remain homogeneous? Now friends, at this point I have to say uh, that having a majority group of people in the church is not wrong, but it is wrong when we try our best, when we want to maintain that majority for our convenience sake for our comfort, rather than forsaking them for the sake of the gospel. Second group, I would like to address parents. Dear parents, how do you ensure that your parenting encourages your children to be open, loving, accepting, and missional towards people from different backgrounds? I've heard of Christian parents using racial slurs and derogatory terms towards other people. Now friends, when we ourselves show no regard or respect to someone else's race or status, we cannot expect our children to respect them. Our children learn from us on how we treat people who are not like us. If we love them, if we pray for them, and we are always eager to share Jesus with them, our children will see the gospel living in us. They will learn that every people are created with dignity in the image of God. No one is common or unclean. You know, parents, I would like to share something very personal to you this morning. As someone who is from Malaysia, uh, for those of you who don't know, my wife is a Malaysian Chinese. I'm a Malaysian Indian, right? Back home in Malaysia, whenever my wife and I walk down the road or in a shopping complex, holding hands, there will be at least a few looks, few people looking at us as though we have done something, something that we shouldn't have done. I mean, I, I can't be correcting every racist person on the road, right? That's not my job, all right? But it's a picture of how racism can be passed down from generation to generation. Malays, Indians, and Chinese in Malaysia have been living together for decades. I don't know how many donkey years we've been living together. And yet, racism has been passed down. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this to you, parents, is that if there is someone who can put a stop to this, it is us, the Christians, especially Christian parents. You have been given the power the privilege and the responsibility to teach your kids that God shows no favoritism. And we should do the same. So another, perhaps an intentional activity, let me suggest something to you, an intentional activity you can do with your kids is to pray together. I know of parents who intentionally spend time praying every night for different groups of people using materials from Joshua Project or Operation World. Perhaps that's something you can do, parents. I even know of parents who deliberately send their children to schools where the students are from different socioeconomic or racial background so that their children will learn to respect them and share Christ with them. Now, parents, how many of us think along that line? Or do we end up protecting our children from the world and produce Christians who are tribalistic instead of missional. Lastly, 
I would like to ad uh, address young adults and uh, youths. Friends, who are the people you hang out most with? Ask yourself this question. On your weekends, who are the peeps you chill with? I'm trying my best to use your lingo. Huh? <laughs> are they within the same cultural or social background as you? Do you hang out with them and not other people because you don't want to feel out of place? Or perhaps you may even justify not connecting with others because I don't know what we can talk about. We don't have anything in common. Friends, we are called to love and reach out, not give excuses whether we have things in common or not. Imagine if Peter would have said that in Acts 11. Imagine Peter would have said that. I don't think I have anything in common I can't share with them. If he would have said that, the message of the gospel would not have reached us here today. All of us here in this room would, have been, would, would still be living our own lives, pagans. But God shows no partiality and wants us to be his agents, his gospel bearers. Let us not make the same mistake as the Jews in Acts 11. So challenge yourselves this week, young people, at your workplace or your school, when you feel like going out to a, a cafe or shopping or for sports, are you going to choose people based on how you can gel or how comfortable you are or because you want to be missional towards them? Or perhaps a much more personal question to you. What kind of person are you looking for to be your boyfriend or your girlfriend? What are the criteria you have? Ask yourselves. Does godliness and a love for Jesus come to the top of the list? Or financial status, social status, and racial background? I've met many Christians, many Christian youths, right, who say they are ready for a relationship, but amongst their top three criterion, there happens to be two popular conditions. You want to know what that is? One, the person has to be of the same financial status. Second, person has to be of the same racial background. Friends, again, all right, it is not wrong to date or marry someone who is of the same financial or social or racial status as you. It is not wrong. But if tribalism drives your criteria for a spouse and not the gospel, you're missing the whole point of the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is to love one another unfailingly. So friends, I hope we can put what we have learned today into practice this week. And as for me, you might be wondering now, Tony, you're talking a lot. What are you going to do? As for me, my personal application for this week is I'm going to spend time with a non-Christian friend from a totally different walk of life, and uh, I'm planning to invite him to church next week, so do pray for him as well. As a conclusion, brothers and sisters in Christ, we should thank God because unlike the risk category criteria to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, God's vaccine is freely available for everyone, for everyone immediately through the blood of Jesus. No cost, no criteria, no waiting time. It's cool. So on what basis does God save people? God does not save people based on social, cultural, or any other background, but solely on the basis of His grace and our faith in Jesus. And because of that, we too are called to convey this message of grace and hope to every nation, tribe, and tongue. But it will be impossible to do so if we ourselves show favoritism and don't love people sincerely. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to reflect and apply what we have learned today so that we too may love others despite their background, so that we can share the message of your grace faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray.